Welcome to the Dare to Know podcast. I'm your host, Fabian Korver. Today, we are joined by Frances Egan. Frances Egan is a professor of philosophy at Rutgers University. She has authored a number of articles and book chapters on philosophy of mind, philosophy of cognitive science, and perception. Today, we will talk in particular about Professor Egan's article in the book, Chomsky and his critics, which is called Naturalistic Inquiry, Where Does Mental Representation Fit In? Professor Egan, welcome to the Dare to Know podcast. Thank you, Fabian. Nice to meet you. Nice to be here. Great. So maybe to start off, could you maybe tell us a bit about your background? So what has your philosophical journey been like? And uh, when did you kind of become interested in the work of Noam Chomsky? And how has he potentially influenced your philosophical views? Yeah, so um, I grew up and was educated in Canada. I went. I my, did my undergraduate work at the University of Manitoba. And Pat and Paul Churchland were important early influences. They, uh, their enthusiasm for empirically informed philosophy, for science in general, and, and also for empirically informed philosophy was really contagious. So they were an important early influence. Um, I did my PhD in the philosophy of science at the University of Western Ontario. And I've spent my whole career uh, at Rutgers. And uh, it's been a great place to do philosophy of mind and cognitive science. So I've, I've been very lucky. Okay, great. So yeah, maybe uh, to start off, uh, uh, one of Chomsky's major distinctions is between methodological naturalism and uh, metaphysical naturalism. So Chomsky uh, uh, puts forward a defense of methodological naturalism. So, and according to him, many philosophers actually do hold kind of this uh, uh, methodological dualism. So can you maybe explain these kind of terms and kind of what Chomsky defense uh, is for methodological naturalism and, and kind of uh, how these kind of views compete? Yeah, so um, the view that he calls metaphysical naturalism is typically kind of a commitment to physicalism um, about the mind, commitment to kind of a mind-body identity. Mm -hmm. um, the view that he calls methodological naturalism, on the other hand, it's not really a thesis at all. It's a commitment to um, using scientific empirical methods in the study of mind and language. Um, so he... The, the, idea, the, the idea of methodological dualism, I don't think that anybody really embraces it. I don't think anybody would really say, I'm a methodological dualist. Rather, I think it's a position that Chomsky thinks, and I think he's right about this, that a lot of uh, philosophers of mind and language fall into. So uh, methodological naturalism, is, uh, as I've said, it's a commitment to the idea that mind and language should be studied uh, should be studied uh, by the empirical sciences. Methodological dualism is the idea that there are independent kind of a priori constraints on acceptable work uh, in the study of mind and language. And Chomsky thinks that that's illegitimate because the other sciences are allowed to be self-policing. They set their own standards for what are acceptable explanations, for example. So as I said, um, I don't think anybody would actually embrace the label of methodological dualism, but um, some of the work in, in on, on mind and language, I, I think, does, does seem to assume kind of a priori uh, restrictions on what's acceptable. So, for example, um, I think Chomsky's, Chomsky thinks that a commitment to, met, to metaphysical uh, naturalism is itself an example of methodological dualism, a commitment, say, to, to mind-body identity. Uh, he thinks that that's based on an outmoded notion of body that was exploded in the, in the 18th century. So I think that he thinks that metaphysical commitments about the nature of mind and language that drive inquiry or investigation into, into the study of mind and language, those, those, are, uh, those are examples of methodological dualism. So some um, commitments that would count as methodologically dualist um, might be prejudices that we have, kind of uh, that may have come from from any number of places. Um, others, I think, might be the result of a lot of a good deal of philosophical reflection. So the sources of these method methodologically dualist prejudices can be uh, can, they can come from all over. A favorite example of mine of methodological dualism is the idea that um, that the explanation of intentional capacities should, itself needs to appeal to 
intentional structures or intentional states. I think that that, I think that if we look at some of the best theories of intentional capacities, like for example, David Mars, mm -hmm. um, it, doesn't sat, it doesn't satisfy that constraint. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my example of, of methodological dualism. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And, and so basically when he says, okay, we can actually uh, identify this uh, uh, metaphysical naturalism kind of with physicalism, then we can kind of say, okay, many, uh, there are many physicalists out there. So how do they respond? Do you know any responses that these physicalists have against Chomsky of him claiming that they are kind of uh, keeping to this methodological dualism? Has there been any like actual engagement with, between these kind of views? Yeah, I think there's been quite a bit of work in trying to, I think a lot of, a lot of so-called physicalists recognize the problem uh, characterizing this, the notion of physicalism, one that's, uh, that, that, that makes sense of, of uh, contemporary physics, uh, but doesn't necessarily commit to mental categories and mental phenomena being identified with current physics either. So there's a lot of work uh, on that by, by, by methodologic, by, sorry, by metaphysical uh, naturalists about the mind, but I don't think there's really been any consensus on that. I don't know of any uh, philosophers of mind committed to, to metaphysical naturalism who've actually addressed uh, Chomsky's particular objection. I think rather there's a lot of work trying to trying to sort out how best to understand these metaphysical commitments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, so when we look at kind of Chomsky's naturalistic approach, he kind of uh, says that with science we're focusing kind of on our theoretical understanding of the world. But on the other hand, he also recognizes that there is such a thing as kind of the perspective of ethnoscience. So can you maybe explain kind of uh, these different ways of understanding how we look at the world. So we have on one hand, of course, the scientific worldview, but also on the other hand, we have kind of ethnoscience. So how does he demarcate between these kind of different ways of understanding uh, and how, how should we make sense of that? Yeah, um, in some of my earlier work, I, I identified uh, ethnoscience with a kind of methodology and Chomsky has pointed out that that's a mistake. So ethnoscience, as he understands it, is really uh, the study of our common sense conception mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of everything, of ourselves, of cognitive capacities, of mental states, of motion. Uh, so it, it, it embraces kind of the study of folks, of what we call folk psychology, and the study of folk science. Mm -hmm. And I think that on, on his account, um, there's nothing suspect about that. So ethnoscience, I think, is probably best understood as a, as a kind of anthropology. Mm -hmm. And ethnoscientists can employ good, rigorous, empirical methods um, to study uh, these, these, these folk views on these various, uh, various aspects of reality. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And, and maybe one thing uh, that comes to mind is kind of uh, thinking about uh, Wilfred Sellers' distinction between, for example, the scientific image and the manifest image. Does that kind of map onto kind of this scientific view uh, 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 of Chomsky and also then kind of maybe uh, more the uh, uh, ethnoscience view? Do you think there's this kind of direct uh, uh, mapping onto kind of cell distinction or how do you think they're different? Yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, I think that ethnoscience would be the study of the manifest image mm -hmm. in all of its various domains. I hadn't thought of that, of that connection, but I think that's, that's a good way of, uh, of characterizing what Chomsky means by ethnoscience. Mm, okay, very interesting. So, so Chomsky also states that within science itself, kind of the explanatory uh, theories of mind and language are going to be invariably internalist. So can you maybe explain kind of these different approaches uh, between internalist and externalist theories, and, and then also kind of explain why is it that Chomsky favors these in internalist uh, approaches, and also him sometimes accusing that even kind of the externalist, maybe while denying it, still kind of takes this internal baggage on board when they kind of put forward their own theories. Okay, um, so let me start with kind of the standard characterization of externalism. Um, it's generally understood as the idea that uh, mental states and uh, the meanings of words, so it's a pretty broad thesis covering both language and mind. The idea is that uh, mental states and the meanings of words are char essentially characterized or individuated in part by reference to the environment in which the subject is situated. Uh, so two different subjects could be physically identical and still, and still have different beliefs or mean different things by their words. And internalism is usually characterized as the rejection of that. So internalists deny that identical, physically or intrinsically identical subjects could have different beliefs or could mean different things by their words. Mm 
Um, so that's the standard characterization. Chomsky says that Chomsky says that that internalism is a commitment to uh, to the study of internal states, and that's pretty vague. That's compatible with externalism, as I've characterized it. I think what he really means, though, is that um, his project is understanding linguistic competence, and that is best studied. Uh, by internalist methods, not by characterizing uh, states of subjects, their capacities, processes, and so on, by reference to the environment um, in which they're situated. I think that he thinks that, that linguistic competence can be completely characterized internally, and so two subjects who are intrinsically identical, and a consequence of this is that two subjects who are intrinsically identical. Uh, Will be will will have the, give get the same characterization. Their, their linguistic competence will be the same. So for Chomsky, one reason he thinks that linguistic competence is uh, is to be studied in, uh, in from an internalist perspective is of course that a lot of our linguistic competence is a result of an of an innate endowment. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's part of the commitment to internalism. Mm, very interesting. So maybe uh, I would like to mention one quote by Chomsky. So he states. Uh, it is only by virtue of its integration into such performance systems that this brain state qualifies as a language. Some other organism might, in principle, have the same eye language, brain state, as Peter, but embedded in performance systems that use it for locomotion. Following up uh, on this, you state yourself, uh, it follows then that an eye language is an abstractly characterized mechanism or procedure that is not essentially part of the language faculty at all. So I think this is a, a kind of a crucial uh, uh, paragraph in the text where we're kind of saying, okay, this eye language is not an essential part of language. So kind of how should we understand that? And could you maybe unpack it, uh, why this is so? Yeah, good. So an eye language, uh, eye language as Chomsky kind of uses it in, in his in work in linguistics, is a characterization of the, of the FLN, the faculty of language narrowly construed, and that's an internalist characterization. And that, uh, the faculty of language, the FLN is characterized by a grammar. So the grammar specifies um, what the FLN does, and it takes as input le lexical items and produces as output uh, two descriptions that go to various, uh, various uh, performance systems. That very mechanism that's characterized uh, by, by taking in certain structures and producing as output certain structures, that very mechanism, which happens to subserve our linguistic capacity, might be found somewhere else um, in, the, in the brain, subserving a different um, cognitive capacity, maybe subserving uh, locomotion, for example. Uh, so that, that, that's the idea. The, the, the mechanism, the FLN, is characterized in such a way that we could actually think of it as being taken out of the language module or the language system and plugged into some other cognitive system, and it would do the very same thing. It would take in structures and spit out or output structures that would then be, serve as interfaces to further downstream performance systems. So I think the best example of this is from MAR. Um, MAR characterizes, it's just one of many examples in MAR, and one of many examples that we find um, in, in, in a lot of work in computational cognitive science. So MAR characterizes a, a, mechan a little mechanism, a, a, a filter in the early visual system that computes uh, a, a, the Laplacian of a Gaussian. And what it does in the visual system is it smooths the image and then passes on the output to further processes. Because a lot of the information in the image will be noise, or at least uh, not useful for what the visual system is, is ultimately going to do. This mechanism might be found in other, other perceptual uh, processes in the brain. So we can imagine that that very mechanism, and when I say that very mechanism, I mean a mechanism that computes that particular mathematical function mm -hmm. uh, might serve as a filter, say, in the auditory system. Mm -hmm. So when Chomsky talks about uh, an eye language, um, he's talking about that mechanism that's really to be understood, to be, that's characterized kind of independently of what's going on 
around it, not just in the world, but kind of in the rest of the, uh, of the, of the subject's brain. So it's really radically internalist in that sense. Because I'm just clarifying uh, for myself, because it's radically internalist in the sense that even within the organism itself, we're kind of dividing up these parts. Uh, 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 is, is that right? Yes, that's exactly right. So in, in a sense, it's not even essentially a linguistic mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, just like Mars little filter is not essentially uh, a visual mechanism, what's essential to it is the mathematical function that it computes and it could do that in different internal environments um, as, as well as in, in different, obviously in different external environments. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I think we will discuss a little bit later in the conversation also, uh, in, indeed, the, the uh, similarities between, indeed, Chomsky's work and, and Mars' work. Uh, but moving on a little bit, uh, Chomsky also kind of argues uh, against the notions of reference and, and public, public language, which are extremely relevant for external semantics. So can you maybe explain just briefly why Chomsky thinks that these are kind of problematic uh, 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 notions to have? Yeah, good. So, um, so reference is a relation that holds between uh, a word and, and what it's about in the world, uh, or a, a thought and what it's, what it's about in the world. So it's, it's generally construed to be a two-place relation. Mm -hmm. uh, Chomsky thinks that he's very skeptical uh, of, that, uh, of the idea that we could ever get a specification of a relation between, say, items in the head and items in the world that looks anything like our understanding of reference. But he thinks that, uh, so he's got a couple of different um, objections to the notion. One I think is, is what I've just said, the idea that there's actually going to be a theory of reference, or at least a theory of reference delivered by linguistics mm -hmm. um, that looks anything like our kind of pre-theoretic notion of reference. Another um, objection to the notion of reference, I think, is to the role that it plays in externalist semantics. I don't know if you were gonna ask me about this, but um, extern the externalist semantics is, is often um, supported by intuitions that we have about twins. And those intuitions are intuitions about what, uh, what the various subjects are referring to, what the reference of their, of their terms or their thoughts are in the various environmental contexts. And Chomsky thinks that, um, that we, and, and now I mean not just philosophers of language, but kind of uh, members of our, our linguistic communities whose intuitions are being probed, don't have uh, reliable intuitions about reference. So the notion of reference, partly it's, I mean, it's because it's a technical notion. And so supposed intuitions about uh, reference are not really worth a lot. So, so this would, for example, be an example where like our common sense understanding of the world and then having this technical notion don't necessarily converge where we can use our common sense intuitions to actually understand the technical notion that we're trying to build uh, uh, in, exactly. for example, scientific theory. Mm. Okay, that's very exactly. interesting. So, so Chomsky also talks uh, a lot about kind of the, the limits of naturalistic inquiry. So he says, of course, we can indeed kind of get this theoretical understanding, but he's not afraid to point out that there might be all sorts of limits that we're dealing with here, uh, uh, merely because of our kind of cognitive capacities. So, so what are some potential uh, issues that fall outside of the scope of naturalistic inquiry, according to Chomsky? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that he thinks it's an open question what falls out of, uh, of the, uh, of what lies outside the limits of naturalistic inquiry. Um, I think he thinks that um, our common sense understanding, so of course the study of our common sense understanding is ethnoscience, and that falls within, uh, within naturalistic inquiry. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, some, I, I, I'm not, he's not really clear about this, I think that he thinks that uh, the study of some of the study of language use mm -hmm. might fall outside of naturalistic inquiry. For example, if the study is pervaded is pervaded by uh, our kind of common sense views on what people are doing when they're when they're communicating. Mm -hmm. um, he's also got this idea that um, he he suspects that maybe consciousness might lie outside the limits of naturalistic inquiry. Um, but really, this is, a, is kind of a different matter. He thinks that we might be, it's not that, so with, with, in the former case, it's aspects of what we're studying uh, that might, or the way we're studying it, 
that might lead to uh, to the inquiry actually not meeting the standards of not meeting scientific objective standards. There are other um, other domains that I think might kind of in principle fall outside what we're our cognitive limits, what we're capable of understanding, and and one of these might be consciousness. Mm -hmm. But interestingly. Um, He's very circumspect about, about saying what might fall outside the, nat the limits of naturalistic inquiry. I, I don't know how reflective uh, his, his circumspection is, but it, if he were to say, for example, that subject matter X is by its very nature outside of what we can study, I think he would, think, he would consider that to be taking a, a methodologically dualist attitude mm -hmm. because we can't kind of a priori say, um, what our cognitive limits are, and we can't a priori independently of you know, a lot of investigations say that certain certain domains of inquiry fall outside of naturalistic inquiry. Mm -hmm. So I think he's really pretty careful uh, about what he says about what's definitely outside of naturalistic inquiry. Yeah, that's very interesting. One other topic that comes to mind is also the, the, the free will topic. I, I often see him indeed say that it, it might be explainable by science, but not necessarily committing to anything. And that, that would be interesting then to, to, to look at indeed other philosophers who, who might have a strong view on that and say, for example, uh, uh, Kant saying, uh, no, actually, if we take a theoretical understanding, then this definitely uh, lies outside of kind of the theoretical domain. So um, uh, do you know by any chance if he engages on that kind of specifically with regards to like free will? So is he kind of really uh, kind of pointing towards uh, 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 different scientific uh, research that is being done related to, for example, the issue of free will. So I know, for example, he also talks sometimes about kind of the neuroscience example that uh, a bit, bit kind of brain scans like a few milliseconds before the decision is already made. So then he sometimes talks about kind of the broad view, okay, we don't really understand what kind of the puppeteer is doing. We're just a puppet. Uh, what are kind of maybe uh, some implications of that related to just understanding the philosophy of mind or cognitive science more broadly? Yeah, um, I don't. I don't know that work of his, um, so I wouldn't really want want to say too much about it. Um, again, I guess I would just say that he's skeptical that he's in the last. You know, for quite for many decades, he's expressed some skepticism about about act, actually producing a, uh, an account of, of performance or of human behavior. Mm -hmm. Partly that's because um, there are so many variables that go into determining human behavior. Um, and one of those might be free will, mm -hmm. uh, which really cha completely changes. It's not just complexity. It's not just intractability. If there is, uh, if there is actual free will, then that, then, then that, that adds a, 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 a complicating factor of it, really a, a completely different type into the mix. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think he's, he's definitely open to the possibility of free will. He sometimes suggests that he actually thinks there is uh, he says things that it can, looks like they committed to free will. Yeah. Um, I, so I think, yeah, yeah. I think one example that, that jumps to mind is sometimes indeed when someone is skeptical, at least we're a little bit like, okay, there is no such thing as free will. Then he says something like, okay, well, try the next day to not want to do anything and see how long that works. <laughs> so indeed there he seems to be kind of pushing also against view. No, there is definitely not free will. So maybe he's then kind of trying to balance out his views. But yeah, that, that's interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, I think on the other side, um, what the uh, determinist might, might, might cite something like, might say that that's kind of like G.E. Moore's argument that against skepticism that, look, I have two hands. Um, mm, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, no, I, yeah. Certainly from within, uh, it seems pretty clear that we do have free will. Yeah, no, true. So um, I think that's a really a pretty complicated issue. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so maybe uh, shifting gears a little bit, uh, kind of Chomsky has also stated that it is possible that natural language will only have syntax and pragmatics, therefore kind of crucially leaving out uh, semantics. So how should we understand this claim? Yeah. Um, so let's go back to reference for a minute, um, just so I can just fill in a little bit of background. So what he thinks that, uh, that, we, that we won't find is any two-place relation between uh, words or, or thoughts and, and items in the world that, they're, that, that they represent. He thinks that there's more hope um, for uh, maybe getting a, 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 a semantics that provides reference, uh, specifies a four-place relation between a thinker, uh, a context of use, uh, a, a word or a thought, and, and the entity in the world that it's about. So he thinks that we might be able to uh, specify 
a, a, an interesting mapping of uh, ordered pairs of uh, or, ordered uh, quadruples of the agent. So the, uh, the, the, the subject refers to X, some object, by a particular word on a particular occasion of use. So we, that might be possible. Mm -hmm. However, he thinks that that project falls outside the domain of, of linguistics. Mm -hmm. Linguistics isn't going to come up with um, a semantics of that sort. So the semantics that, that, that linguistics delivers, at least according to his minimalist program, is just the, it's just the output of the FLN, the Faculty of Language Narrowly Construed. And remember that those are just, uh, those are just descriptions. Those are just structures. Mm -hmm. um, and they feed into um, different performance systems, the, um, the, 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 what he calls the conceptual intentional system. He doesn't really say much about that. So downstream of that, um, they may get interpreted. But Chomsky says nothing about what, what goes on once the faculty of the, the FLN delivers uh, the, 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 uh, the LF, the, lo the logical form. That's all the meaning that linguistics, ling linguistics proper, maybe we could say, um, is concerned with. And what's delivered by FLN is going to give us, um, it, it, it's not, so he calls that syntax, it's kind of, it's kind of semantic-y in the sense that it's going to give us uh, some decompositional properties uh, uh, of the structures. So it will explain, for example, how we get um, dogs barked, how we can infer dogs barked from dogs, from uh, dogs barked loudly. But it's not gonna tell us the difference. It's not gonna allow us to understand or explain the difference between dogs barked and cats meowed. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. Uh, so it's not, it's not gonna deliver what FLN delivers and what Chomsky calls all, all the semantics that we're going to get is not going to give us anything that's going to determine uh, truth conditions. It's not going to be a referential semantics. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen downstream. How? He doesn't even speculate on. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. On Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, uh, focusing kind of on the notion of representation. So, so many people, and this also, of course, uh, uh, already uh, relates to what we've been discussing, but many people assume that kind of when one talks about representation, one must speak of a representation of something. And Chomsky thinks that this is kind of a philosophical dogma uh, uh, that has been in place and he kind of critiques it. So how should we understand the notion of representation and, and how does this relate indeed to science and also to uh, kind of the internalism that we've been discussing? Okay, good. So I think that he shouldn't say that representation of is a, is a philosophical dogma. I think it's, it's part of our notion of representation. And that notion plays roles all over, you know, everywhere, pretty much in literature, um, in all kinds of sciences and, and various roles in, in ordinary life. So let, let me just explain why it's illegitimate for him to talk of it as, as kind of a dogma. Um, to representations, uh, are, they involve two elements. They're made up of, of meanings or content. So representations have meaning or content. Now he's gonna dispute that, but let me just kind of lay out the, the standard understanding of representation. Meanings and contents on the one hand, and then something that has the meaning or has or carries the, the meaning or content. And that's, philosophers typically call that the representational vehicle. So for example, um, a particular sequence of sounds will be the vehicle. I'm talking now, but my, that sequence of sounds has, has a meaning too. So the two elements. Um, a map might be um, a bunch of lines on a piece of paper, um, but it's got a meaning. It might be, you know, in, perhaps it's a map of, so now we got the notion of representation of, it's a map of New York, maybe. So that's its meaning. So representation talk presupposes this distinction between what it's a representation of and what and the physical thing that actually carries the meaning mm -hmm. uh, or, or content so what was the so that's kind of our, our our understanding of it and that plays a, a crucial role in all kinds of different domains so if i say to you uh you know what what did you mean when you when you made that remark yesterday mm -hmm. so that's not a philosopher's notion so i think he's a little bit I think he's a little bit unfair. What he, what he does say, I mean, we could raise the question, if there's no content, 
then what, how is it a representation? Mm. So um, you think then that the entire notion of representation falls away in some sense if there's no content to attach to it, so to speak? Yeah, if it's just a vehicle, then it's not really a representational vehicle. It's not doing any, it's not doing any carrying. Mm -hmm. It's just a structure. Mm -hmm. um, now, maybe he would say that that's, uh, that, that's just a verbal dispute. I'm quibbling about the, about, and, and, and fair enough. Like, the important point he wants to make with respect to cognitive science is that content or, uh, uh, or, or meaning isn't playing any explanatory or theor theoretical role uh, mm -hmm. in the theories. Mm -hmm. And so maybe he, I mean, maybe he should just talk about structures. Um, mm -hmm. He doesn't, why doesn't he? Well, I think partly to connect with his earlier work. There are questions of, cons of whether he's been consistent. That's, a, that, that's another matter. Mm -hmm. And maybe if we kind of uh, uh, take this notion of representation and now discuss it kind of in the context of, of, of David Smart's famous work on vision. So now we have the notion of representation and the notion of content. So there has been a lot of debate in the literature uh, 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 between kind of uh, how to interpret David Marr's work and Chomsky sits on one side uh, of the debate. So maybe just uh, maybe some broad context. Uh, what is this uh, uh, work on vision by David Mars and, and how did it spur this debate in kind of understanding this notion of representation and the two different camps, uh, how they're interpreting uh, it in different ways? Okay, great. So let me back up a little bit um, and just connect with what, what I previously said. So when Chomsky says it, there, it, there's, there's no notion of representation of playing a role in, in, in cognitive science, what he means, so we, we just got the structures and the structures are characterized kind of essentially or are individuated in terms of their roles in processing. There's just structures and then operations on the structures. There's no, there's no reference, there's no, there's no meaning. So Chomsky thinks that, um, that the notion of content and so full-blooded kind of representation uh, doesn't play a role in, da in David Marr's theory. So, um, the Chomsky's in, let, let me talk a little bit, there's a, an important parallel, I think. The reason I think why, one reason why Chomsky's interested in Marr's work is because he sees Marr as doing in vision what he himself and fellow linguists are doing uh, for language. So what that is, is primarily characterizing a cognitive capacity in terms of a function in the mathematical sense that's computed by the mechanism. And uh, so in the, in, the, in the linguistic case, the function is characterized by the grammar, and the grammar uh, specifies what the FLN is doing in terms of, of, of mapping from lexical items to, uh, to PFs and LFs to the structures that then serve as uh, at, to the as as interfaces to performance systems, mm -hmm. so it's importantly it's a formal characterization of the processes uh, in the mechanism, and there's no content, no no represent none of these structures carry any meaning to anything outside themselves. So that's his account of FLN. Mars theory, he argues, and I think he's exactly right on this. We, we, we agree on the, interpret, on the interpretation of Mars theory. So Mars theory specifies in this same kind of very formal, what I call function theoretic sense, what the visual system is doing. And to go back to that little mechanism, that little filter that I was talking about, um, it's taking uh, arrays uh, and uh, and computing Laplacian Gaussian over, over the image, so over the raw data in the image, and, uh, and uh, outputting um, a description of how, the, how the, the, the intensity changes over the, over the image. So it's doing something that's formally characterizable, and what Marr calls the theory of the computation. Marr's got, this, as you probably know, these three explanatory levels, and he says, the, the first thing that the theorist has to do is specify what the system's doing, give a precise specification of it. And this is a, a formal characterization of the function in the mathematical sense of what the mechanism is doing. So exactly the same kind of specification that Chomsky argues uh, FLN is, is, is giving bilingual, given bilinguistic theory.
So a really nice parallel. Uh, he sees Mars doing envision, Mars and, and, and others. He thinks this is the standard approach uh, for computational accounts of, of cognitive mechanisms. Uh, they're doing the same thing and the theories uh, at this level of description are, are, are similar. Importantly, no, uh, no reference to any, any content, no reference to what these structures might mean um, outside themselves. So, for example, for Mar and Edge, talks about edges, but these are just structures and they're characterized by their, by their role of process, in processing. So the controversy, this, this characterization of, of Mar, which, which I argue for in, in, my, in my early work, and which coincides with, uh, with Chomsky's characterization of what Mars doing um, is very controversial. It's probably, I mean, most philosophers uh, interpreting Mars think that, that content plays a crucial role in characterizing the, 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 the processes and in characterizing the mechanism. Mm -hmm. So that's what Chomsky uh, objects to. I think that, that Chomsky is exactly right in thinking that what Mars do is giving what Mars theory is giving is a, is a formal specification of what the mechanism is doing, and it's analogous to what's going on in, the, in other domains in computational cognitive science, and in particular in linguistics. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, very interesting. So, and when we focus kind of on, the, so basically the topic of computational theories, so, so you believe that in the end content does play an important explanatory role as function in computation, computational theories, and then you talk about kind of the notion of an intentional explanatory gloss. So I know that this is not something Chomsky puts forward, but maybe it would be interesting to kind of see how you still give, so you agree, as you mentioned, with Chomsky and kind of, for example, uh, this, this first part and how to characterize it in like a formal way, but then you do say, okay, we don't have to do away with the notion of content. Actually, it does serve a purpose. So can you maybe lay out uh, uh, how you come kind of to this conclusion of kind of this intentional gloss and kind of what the implications are for understanding, for example, uh, uh, what cognitive science is doing? Okay, so let me start that by just, by just noting another point of agreement between, between Chomsky and I, and that is that Chomsky argues that we can't just uh, read the correct interpretation of a theory off the theorist's words, mm -hmm. off what the theorist says uh, when they're explicating the theory, uh, when they're writing textbooks and so on, that a lot of what they say is really, to, as he puts it, to motivate the view. It's informal motiv mo motivation or informal kind of explication, partly given the way that we kind of pre-theoretically understand the domain that, uh, under analysis. So I think he's exactly right about that. And I think that the opposition uh, about the role of, I mean, the, the, I've said that it's very controversial, that most interpreters think that the semantic interpretation that content does play an individuative role. I think that's because they're doing what Chomsky guards against. They're taking too literally and too seriously uh, the theorist's words in explaining, explaining the theory. So Chomsky and I are, are in complete agreement about that. But I think, I mean, the, the disagreement that I have with Chomsky is I think that representational content does play uh, an important role uh, in computational models. And so I think he's completely, what he's characterized uh, as computational theory, I think he's right about that, but I call that the theory proper. It's a formal characterization of the function computed by the mechanism. It's a characterization of the structures and processes, structures and, and causal processes that operate on those structures. It's a characterization of the algorithm whereby the function is computed by the mechanism. And um, uh, lastly, an important element uh, that Chomsky doesn't talk about because he's concerned with language and so it doesn't really apply in the, lang in the, in the language case, but certainly for theories of perception, uh, the, the, the last element of what I call the theory proper is what I call an ecological component. And so uh, the theorist has to explain how computing a particular mathematical function, how oper you know, causal operations on structures that are characterized uh, simply causally and not by, in terms of what they, uh, what they might refer to in, in the world. The theorist has to say how all of that actually allows the organism to see, mm -hmm. how it accomplishes the, 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 the task that the theory set out to explain and to characterize. 
And I think that's only done by what I call an ecological component specification of certain very general features of the environment uh, that explain why computing a Laplacian of a Gaussian, for example, in, in context allows us to detect edges. And this is an important element in Mars theory. He talks about physical constraints. Um, and these are very, these are, this is what I'm calling the ecological component of the theory. Mm -hmm. very, very interesting. Okay, so, sorry. No, no, go ahead, sorry. So far, that's just, that's what, what I call the theory proper. Importantly, no representational content in that. Yeah. So the ecological component specifies, for example, uh, that objects are rigid in translation, uh, Shimon Ullman's example, but no, no reference in any of the, what I've just laid out to representational content. Yet, I think, and here's the disagreement with Chomsky, that content, uh, what the, what I call the intentional gloss, then goes on to say, to specify for the structures that are explained in the theory, that are posited in the theory, um, it specifies contents, what they're about um, in the external world. So for example, the structure edge, which is characterized in the theory purely causally, I mean, purely, purely in terms of, I should, I should qualify that. I don't mean causally with respect to what's ca what causes it in the world. I mean, just the pro internal processes that operate on it. That structure that's characterized in that way in the theory, in what I call the intentional gloss, is assigned the content edge. So that structure refers to uh, certain distal properties in the environment. And, it's, and the intentional gloss ascribes it that content. So that's the difference uh, between me and Chomsky. I think that there, there's something left over. There's something still that still needs to be done uh, after we've got what I call the theory proper. And that is, uh, and, and that's served by the intentional gloss. Now, I, I should qualify what I just said. When I say something that needs to be done, I think that the, what I call the theory proper, those elements that I've just laid out, actually allows us, allows us to explain everything that we, that we that we really need explained by a theory of vision. But I think that by attributing content or scribing content to these internal structures, we get, uh, we, we, we get something in addition to that. It serves certain expository heuristic purposes that the theory itself kind of leave, uh, don't bother to do. So for example, what are some of those purposes? Well, one, probably the most important one is that we understand uh, con uh, cognitive or uh, intentional capacities, kind of we understand them as, as giving us information about the world. So for example, a theory of vision should tell us, should, should explain how we get to know what's where out there. That's actually how Marr characterizes it. And so by, by ascribing content to the purely formally described structures in the theory, we get we, we, we get those, ex we can see, ah, okay, I can see how that structure, uh, it represents something out, you know, represents an edge out there. Mm -hmm. So we get, so the, the, the intentional gloss with the attribution of representational contents and typically external contents, distal contents, contents in the world, uh, connects in, 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 in a, a, a more, you know, in a kind of a more intimate way, a tighter way with the understanding of the target capacity that we started with, our kind of pre-theoretic, maybe even kind of a common sense understanding of what this mechanism is doing. But that's, that, that's a kind of a heuristic job. That's an explicatory job. Um, it's in the gloss, it's important. Uh, Chomsky thinks it, it, it's not important. Uh, he doesn't think that there's a, any notion of content can, that can actually do that job because content, there's, we don't really have a clear notion of content. Let me say one other thing that the gloss does several things, but let, let me just point out one other thing that it does. The, the, the um, processes that are described in the brain, in the, in the mechanism, they're causal processes uh, described by the theory. But by saying that that's an edge, by saying that that, that that thing in there in there represents edges in the world, it allows kind of consumers of the theory, students of vision, uh, other theorists, and, and so on, to kind of understand and keep track of what that causal process is. Because what's going on in the mechanism is pretty complicated. 
So by saying, oh, there's the structure edge. By the way, that's the thing that way back in the outside world was actually you know, caused by, by uh, looking, at, looking at edges. That's what's going on here. So by, by ascribing content to it, we can kind of keep track of what that, of that structure as it's being processed uh, in, in, the, in, in, in the mechanism. Mm -hmm. So those are just two, two things that, that uh, two, two roles or functions served by contents. But again, their contents are part of the gloss. Mm -hmm. We get a full explanation of everything that we really need uh, by just the theory itself. So Chomsky's right about that. But yet I think the gloss is serving some additional important heuristic and explanatory purposes. And maybe also related to, to all of this is also kind of, so Chomsky wants to do away with kind of all these normative notions. And, and, and I think this, this relates to what, what you've just been saying also related to the gloss, namely that uh, uh, it should be okay to use kind of these normative notions because then you say <laughs> it is after all our science. Um, so maybe this is quite a broad question. I also asked uh, uh, Professor Collins before, like kind of how does Chomsky think about the notion of normativity and how it relates to science? And, and can we really do away with these notions of normativity to kind of get, in your words, our science? <laughs> or for example, our science going. So, I mean, that's what I said to Professor Collins last week. I mean, some people might argue that we actually need these normative notions to even get the enterprise of science going. I mean, this is a little bit different angle, but still kind of the broad topic of normativity is at play here and, and how that is needed and how it relates to kind of the, the, the enterprise of science. Yeah, so I think that um, the normativity is primarily in what we expect the scientific theories to explain. Mm -hmm. It's in kind of their, their mandate or their remit. Mm -hmm. um, and part of what we want, say, a, a theory of vision to explain is how we're successful in getting around in the world. Now, the notion of success is obviously a normative notion, and we're not always successful in doing that, we suffer various sorts of illusions and so on. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, so we, we want the theory to actually explain our successes and our failures. Mm -hmm. What I'm calling the, Ch Chomsky thinks that that's just, uh, that's folk interests, that, that, that's, we're, that's just a parochial interest that we have in, 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 uh, in understanding these things and, and, and that science shouldn't, in a sense, kind of science shouldn't take those interests seriously. Mm -hmm. But I think that, uh, I think that that's, that's wrong. So we want a theory of vision to explain how the organism is successful where it is and how it fails where it is. As I've said, I think that, that the th what I call the theory proper can do that. But more generally, maybe, um, we see that w the, the kinds of explanatory targets for cognitive theories are capacities that we have, or competences that we have, and we characterize many of those capacities kind of, they're not just uh, mechanical processes, they're competences, they're rational capacities. Mm -hmm. So competence itself is actually a normatively laden term. Um, and of course, Chomsky, his famous competence performance distinction, uh, he's characterizing linguistic competence, that's what he thinks is best is best explained by internalist theories and so on. So the notion of competence is itself normatively laden. Mm. I don't think that there are, that I, I don't see normative notions in, the, in computational theories themselves. So, but we could see, and you know, what I might, our under, Chomsky is in my, my understanding of how, uh, computational theories explain cognitive capacities is by, maybe this isn't so much Chomsky's, but it's certainly the way that I, that, that I express the point, that it's in virtue of having a particular mathematical competence mm -hmm. that, uh, that organisms, or more particularly the, the, the their cognitive mechanisms, are able to, uh, to underwrite or make possible the cognitive capacities of, of the subject of the organism. Mm -hmm. So, with, back to your point about it being our science, we have, we see our, certain of our activities as exercises of rational capacities, and we want the theories, uh, our scientific theories, to address the way that we see our behavior. It's not just bodily motion, it's 
we're successful in, in doing certain things and unsuccessful in doing, in doing other things. So this redresses Chomsky's point. You know, the Martians might not care. Mm -hmm. they, they might not care to see certain of our activities as rational and others, uh, others as not. So part of what the representational gloss is doing is allowing us to see certain runs of the mechanism or certain, certain outputs of the certain computational processes or formal mechanical processes as accurate representations of what's out there and other runs of the mechanism, other computations, uh, other causal sequences as misrepresentations. And that distinction between rep accurate representation and misrepresentation, uh, it's not in the theory. That's a normative distinction. Uh, it's not in the theory, but it's recoverable in the intentional gloss and it, allow, it allows us to explain uh, how, you know, as, 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 as the agents in the world, the way that we see things, much of our activity, as I've said, kind of falls into, there's the good stuff and the bad stuff. And the, the gloss allows us to, to, to recover that distinction. Uh, that's in a sense recoverable in the theory itself, but only by a great deal of, uh, of uh, specification of here's the general features of the environment and this is the causal process and in context it, uh, it, uh, we can get we can get an account of the organism's success and its failures but by attributing content we get oh that's a representation that's a misrepresentation that gives us almost in one fell swoop kind of the the, the distinction that we cared about when we we started the scientific enterprise mm -hmm. and, and when I, you don't, I don't know if that addresses your question or not. No, def definitely, definitely. Yeah, I think, I think it's very interesting. And I'm just thinking like this um, uh, science for us, like in some sense, uh, I wonder if we start kind of with our, our common sense view and then science informs us, like, uh, uh, is it possible then to indeed come back with kind of a, a common sense view? Because would you say that this intentional gloss is, is, is thoroughly linked with kind of a common sense view, but then just informed by kind of the, the, the theory proper that we've done uh, uh, to kind of, a true kind of scientific inquiry or would you not label that necessarily as kind of common sense that's kind of what i'm trying to figure out well it, it's got to be at least informed by the theory proper so you're not going to get and uh, you're not going to get there they're, they're going to be cognitive constraints on 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 the intentional gloss and it has to be justified and motivated by the theory proper so definitely it's common sense, but very much informed by the theory proper. But then the question is, is it kind of, we start with common sense, then we have the theory proper, then we have kind of a, okay, this is not the right labeling, but like a common sense plus. <laughs> we have that kind of a, a better informed common sense or like how would you kind of uh, uh, describe this kind of dialectic? Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good question. So we start with the common sense understanding of what we want to explain. Then we have the theory proper and we've got the gloss on the, uh, on the, what the, on the theory proper, the, the mathematical and, and mechanical processes described by the theory proper. And when we get the gloss, it allows us to address the questions that, we, that the theory started with. Um, but it might turn out, it's not necessarily going to underwrite and endorse the common sense way of thinking about things. So it might be, and typically it will be, reveal that some of the aspects of our common sense understanding were mistaken. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So that's the sense in which it's informed and built off the, the theory proper. It's got the wherewithal to connect with our common sense understanding, but it's not necessarily and typically won't completely underwrite and, uh, and, and, and justify um, the common sense understanding. It will, it will very often improve it, maybe replace certain aspects of it, mm -hmm. but at least it'll connect with it. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's also, I think you mentioned that somewhere, like the connective tissue. I mean, we already referred to kind of the manifest image and the scientific image, and that's kind of still what you have there with the intentional gloss, that there's at least a connection. <laughs> there's no full disconnect kind of where there's just completely two different kind of ways of understanding where we cannot even make sense of how they would in some sense connect. Right. And I think that Chomsky doesn't think that that project is important. So he doesn't think that scientists have an obligation to address the, the, the way that we pre-theoretically understood the, the, the phenomenon to be explained. Mm -hmm. And maybe one last question. Between us. 
Mm -hmm, I see. Yeah. And maybe one last notion that's just interesting that you mentioned also, I saw that in one of your presentations where you talk about the notion of like a story, just to understanding kind of science and how a lot of science actually builds through kind of this story uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, notion. So can you maybe explain uh, uh, what you mean by that? Yeah, so this is, um, this notion of a story is uh, the German philosopher of science, uh, Stefan Hartmann's notion. And he talks about it in the context of Hadron physics, but it's, it's, it's a completely general notion. And the idea is that uh, the formal apparatus of the theory uh, is, is accompanied by what he calls a story whose job it is basically to just do, to do in general whatever the domain is, what I just said that the representational gloss does for our pre-theoretic understanding of our cognitive capacities. So a story is, uh, is, is kind of an, an extension of or an addition to the, what I'm calling the theory proper, Hart, uh, Hartman doesn't use that notion, but the, 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 the formal model itself, uh, the story allows us to see or specifies how the theory addresses the questions that start that it, that started the inquiry in the first place mm -hmm. and again the story um, will uh, often uh, the, the upshot will often be that uh, some of the pre theoretic theoretic understanding some of those questions were just confused mm -hmm. um, but the, the confusion then will be revealed what's true in the original way of understanding and what's false in the original way of under understanding will be explained and made clear, not, not simply the theory itself probably isn't going to do that, but the, the, the story has the job of doing that. Mm -hmm. Now, so I don't, I mean, it, it'd, be, it'd be an interesting project to see. That's the job of the story. I don't know if there's a g very general characterization of the story beyond it, its job of connecting with the questions that motivated the inquiry in the first place. Um, but it, so in, in physics, it's going to be, there are going to be obviously different questions that motivate uh, inquiry into physics. And what I'm trying to do is capture uh, what those questions are and how an intentional gloss serves to actually address the questions that we start with. So I think that, I, I think Hartman's idea of a story is a very nice kind of, uh, kind of general account of, 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 of some of the, of the obligations that scientists take on in not just kind of kicking away the ladder, but coming back and, and, and spelling out how, look, I've answered these questions. Some of the questions were bad, but here's what's going on. They've got an obligation to do that. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So yeah, Professor Egan, this has been a very interesting conversation. So uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for this. Um, do you have any parting words uh, to the audience? Um, I don't think so. Just uh, that I've, I've enjoyed this a lot. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for your really penetrating questions. And I look forward to, to, to looking at the, uh, the, the, your other podcasts on, on Chomsky and on, on other topics. So, so good luck and, and with the project. I think it's really worthwhile one. Great. Thank you so much.